Hello, this is Christopher from Defeat Modernism, and welcome to the fourth and final part of my series, Liberty of Perdition. This particular video will cover the errors found in the United States Constitution, uh, the Bill of Rights, in the light of Catholic theology. I'll put a link in the description box to the playlist where you can find all four episodes of this series. There will also be a link to the book where I'm drawing the majority of this information from. The title of that book is United States History, A Traditional Catholic Perspective uh, from Christ the King Books. The link in the description, you can purchase the entire book. It does cover U.S. history, starting with Christopher Columbus. And I think uh, those of you who want a, an accurate view, a traditional Catholic view of history, of United States history, I would certainly find that to be a good investment. So let's now get into the United States Constitution. So I'm actually going to start out with some of the, the good qualities found in the U.S. Constitution. As those of us who live in the U.S. know, it's broken up into three distinct parts. You have the legislative branch, the executive, and the judicial, all supposedly having equal power, uh, at least theoretically speaking, and this was designed to reduce the possibility of tyranny or an overthrow or upheaval in the government itself. Now, at this point in our history, it's becoming more and more clear that the executive branch, through the use of executive orders, is overstepping its bounds and putting things through that really should, should be going through the Congress, through the legislative branch. And then for many years, we've had the Supreme Court legislate, which that is not their role. And fortunately, you know, over the past week, few weeks or so, we've seen major rulings overturned, you know, such as the Roe versus Wade, where they had no business uh, legislating things that really belong to the states uh, and or to the legislator, its the legislative branch itself. But human nature being fallen as it is, and being prone to pride and to greed and to lust and to a whole host of evils. Even in Catholic Europe, we had disputes about power and mainly due to greed and pride and, of course, lust in certain instances. If we look at King Henry VIII in particular. And these issues were solved by wars. Um, or if in the case of Spain, when you had a very powerful monarch like Queen Isabella, who happened to set up a, a system of checks and balances. So in some ways, the United States Constitution, we could argue, does match up with what St. Thomas Aquinas proposes as the best form of government. Uh, he says the following. For this is the best form of polity, being partly kingdom, since there is one at the head of all, partly aristocracy, and so in so far as a number of persons are set in authority, partly democracy, that is government by the people, in so far as the rulers can be chosen by the people, and the people have the right to choose their rulers. So we do have a similar setup here in the United States government where you have the one head, the president, uh, a number of persons in authority, so that would be senators and congressmen, and then these people are voted on by the general public. Although the, the corporations, the, the mainstream media, and now social media has entirely too much say on who gets chosen to run for office and then who actually gets elected to office. And of the people we get to choose from, do they really represent us? I would argue and say they represent the interests of the big corporations that back them. They represent their own personal interests. And it's, it's a rare situation where you'll have a congressman or a senator actually doing what is right for his constituents and for the people that he was supposed to represent. And I think that's evident with the, with the so-called laws that we have in this country 
the incredibly high tax burdens that we pay and the the cultural Marxist agendas that are being forced upon everyone. Um, you know, these people supposedly support freedom and liberty, but it's it's only what they say. You're free to only parrot what they tell you to say, what what they want you to believe. You can't you can't think anything contrary to their Judeo Masonic principles. In the last episode on the Declaration of Independence, if you remember, uh, Pope Leo the Thirteenth and other saints, popes had condemned that the sovereignty of the people, that sovereignty is residing in the people. The Constitution implicitly invokes this in the first sentence when it says, we the people of the United States uh, do order and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. So what they're saying there is that the people in their sovereign capacity are establishing the Constitution. They don't invoke a source of higher authority such as a king, which obviously, why would they do that? They they didn't want a king. But they also do not invoke God's authority. And if you remember from the last episode, all authority, all earthly authority comes from God. After the Constitution was written, but before it was ratified by the majority of the states, there were 10 extra laws added to it in order to appease those, those states to sign. Uh, those 10 additions are probably the most famous or the most quote-unquote sacred in the United States. These would be the quote-unquote Bill of Rights. Uh, the original draft of the Constitution was already approved, so these 10 extra laws or amendments were added to the draft of the Constitution. And this is what became known as the First Ten Amendments. So let's begin with the First Amendment to the Constitution, which contradicts Catholic teaching. So the First Amendment states, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or bridging the freedom of speech or of the press. So it makes three separate distinct claims that Congress cannot make a law which states that there's an official religion in the United States. It also says that there is no law that can be made which would be that which would prohibit men from exercising those religious beliefs. And then Congress can't make any laws limiting its citizens, businesses, the religious organizations, the news media, from thinking, saying, or printing anything that they wish, whether it's true or false. So essentially what that's saying is we have a right to not have any national religion. We have a right to not prohibit the free exercise of our religious beliefs. And we have a right that the government in the United States uh, should not make no laws uh, limiting free speech to any organization, any individual, any business, so that you can just say whatever you please. So these are three very dangerous and three very false ideas. So let's look first at the separation of church and state and that particular error. So when you look back in history, particularly at the European nations prior to the Protestant Revolution, which took place in 1517. It was more or less taken for granted that the Catholic religion was the official government, the official religion of those nations, because there was no major, there was no other major religion in Europe at that, at that time. So the hierarchy of the church and the religious orders had the big or the most influence on the governments. And even after the Protestant Revolution, there were entire countries uh, such as England, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, uh, that were torn away from the Catholic Church by the different heretical sects. Uh, but those countries still maintained the, uh, an official state religion, and that would be, of course, Protestantism. But it was 
this was the beginning of the degradation of the of the decay of Christendom of society. Uh, that's why the, the Protestant Revolution is, is probably the biggest disaster in Western civilization because of how it fractured uh, the nations and then you know ultimately led untold millions of people into perdition from following these false teachings of the Protestants. Um, but that led to more revolutions through Freemasonry, uh, Jewish Freemasonry, and then the buildup of what we call now the secular state, where the government supposedly does not show any preference or discrimination against religion. Although I would argue that the government is still does have a state religion, and that would be of godlessness, of the principles of the Masonic Revolution, Luciferianism. You know, the 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 state is united to the church, the Church of Lucifer. Uh, at least that's how I see it um, in, in this day and age, and you know, from the Revolutionary War here in the United States the, to the French Revolution, and then the other revolutions, the communist, the Jewish Masonic um, communist revolutions. You know, throughout Latin America, Europe, Russia, Asia, you know, think of Mao's uh, Great Leap Forward, and what was banned in those in those Masonic countries, where you know Mexico, the Spanish Civil War, um, again China. What did they ban? Who did they kill? You know, they they would kill the Catholic priests. They would kill mass murder. The Catholics, the Christians uh, in Russia. So we know who their leader is. We know what their what their religion is, and it, it is godlessness. It is the worship of Satan, of Lucifer, however you want to term the fallen angel. That is their he is their god, and they will have no other god before him, and that is why Christianity is sought to be destroyed and and suppressed in those countries. And it's also why in this country, uh, quote-unquote laws so-called are passed to try to make Christians go against their faith, uh, against their conscience. You know, let's look at the Obamacare, what that was doing regarding contraception and abortion uh, to Catholic hospitals. Uh, Let's look at these so-called mandates of putting injections into your body uh, that are contrary to Catholic teaching for a number of reasons. You know, the society today is built to lead as many people to hell as possible. That is the, that is the union of the church of Satan and the church and the state. Whereas in Christendom, it was meant the, the society, the state and the church were united and that was to lead people to heaven, to the heavenly kingdom. All right, so you have the city of God versus the city of man, you know, the city of Satan. And the two distinct kingdoms, and we are living in the period of the city of man. And the state religion of the United States would be the synagogue of Satan. I think that's how I think that's the best way to put it. And I and you could say it's a, it's a two-headed snake. One head being the actual synagogue, the other the Freemasonic temple, the Freemasonic lodges, but of the same body, the same body. So they move in the same direction throughout world history with the appearance of being two distinct organizations. But in fact, they are united. They are united in their hatred of God of Christ and of his church. And we have seen them work hand to hand, hand in hand throughout history and principally in this modern age. Now, the principle of separation of church and state has been put forward specifically to destroy the power of the Catholic Church and therefore to destroy souls. And In this instance, it then hands power over to the synagogue of Satan. All right, so this is this is how they have accomplished it, using a false notion like this to deceive people. So let's look at what some of the popes have had to say about this error. First, we'll start with Pope Pius the Ninth. 
He condemned in the Syllabus of Errors the idea that, quote, the church ought to be separated from the state and the state from the church. Leo XIII, in his encyclical letter, Humanum Genus, which was against Freemasonry, he stated, they, that is the Freemasons, thereby teach the great error of this age, that a regard for religion should be held as an indifferent matter, and that all religions are alike. And you'll hear indifferentism, religious indifferentism. Today, the Novus Ordo Church, the Vatican II Church, calls that ecumenism. So the modernist Novus Ordo sect, is, their principle of ecumenism is a Masonic principle. And that's outlined in the Vatican II documents. It's thoroughly Masonic, already condemned by, by several popes. Uh, and I'll go over more of those co condemnations of this so-called right to religious liberty, the separation of church and state. Now to Pope Gregory XVI, and this is again in his encyclical letter Mararivos, coming from paragraph or section 13. Now we consider another abundant source of the evils with which the church is afflicted at present, indifferentism. This perverse opinion is spread on all sides by the fraud of the wicked who claim that it is possible to obtain the eternal salvation of the soul by the profession of any kind of religion as long as morality is maintained. Surely, in so clear a matter, you will drive this deadly error far from the people committed to your care. With the admonition of the apostle, that there is one God, one faith, one baptism. May those fear who contrive the notion that the safe harbor of salvation is open to persons of any religion whatever. They should consider the testimony of Christ himself, that those who are not with Christ are against him, and that they disperse unhappily who do not gather with him. Therefore, without a doubt, they will perish forever unless they hold the Catholic faith whole and inviolate. Now he continues on down in paragraph or section 20 of this same letter where he says, nor can we predict happier times for religion and government from the plans of those who desire vehemently to separate the church from the state and to break the mutual concord between temporal authority and the priesthood. It is certain that the concord which always was favorable and beneficial for the sacred and the civil order is feared by the shameless lovers of liberty. Pope St. Pius X states is in his encyclical letter, Vehementer Nos, which was on the French law of separation. He says the following in section three, that the state must be separated from the church is a thesis absolutely false, a most pernicious error. Based as it is on the principle that the state must not recognize any religious cult, it is in the first place guilty of a great injustice to God. For the creator of man is also the founder of human societies and preserves their existence as he preserves our own. We owe him, therefore, not only a private cult, but a public and social worship to honor him. Besides, this thesis is an obvious negation of the supernatural order. It limits the action of the state to the pursuit of public prosperity during this life only, which is but the proximate object of political societies. And it occupies itself in no fashion, on the plea that this is foreign to it, with their ultimate object, which is man's eternal happiness after this short life shall have run its course. But as the present order of things is temporary and subordinated to the conquest of man's supreme and absolute welfare, it follows that the civil power must not only place no obstacle in the way of this conquest, but must aid us in effecting it. The same thesis also upsets the order providentially established by God in the world, which demands a harmonious agreement between the two societies. Both of them, the civil and the religious society, although each exercises in its own sphere its authority over them, it follows necessarily that there are many things belonging to them in common in which both societies must have relations with one another. Remove the agreement between church and state, and the result will be that from these common matters will spring the seeds of disputes which will become acute on both sides, 
it will become more difficult to see where the truth lies, and great confusion is certain to arise. Finally, this thesis inflicts great injury on society itself, for it cannot either prosper or last long when due place is not left for religion, which is the supreme rule and the sovereign mistress in all questions touching the rights and the duties of men. Hence, the Roman pontiffs have never ceased, as circumstances required, to refute and condemn the doctrine of the separation of church and state. Our illustrious predecessor, Leo XIII especially, has frequently and magnificently expounded Catholic teaching on the relations which should subsist between the two societies. Between them, he says, there must necessarily be a suitable union, which may not improperly be compared with that existing between body and soul. He proceeds, Human societies cannot, without becoming criminal, act as if God did not exist, or refuse to concern themselves with religion, as though it were something foreign to them, or of no purpose to them. As for the Church, which has God himself for its author, to exclude her from the active life of the nation, from the laws, the education of the young, the family, is to commit a great and pernicious error. So what Pius X is talking about, and what all the true popes have proclaimed, is the social kingship of Christ, which was outlined in Pius XI's encyclical letter, Quas Primas, and have a couple of quotes from that. He says here, these manifold evils in the world were due to the fact that the majority of men had thrust Jesus Christ and his holy law out of their lives, that these had no place either in private affairs or in politics. As long as individuals and states refused to submit to the rule of our Savior, there would be no really hopeful prospect of a lasting peace among nations. Men must look for the peace of Christ in the kingdom of Christ. Once men recognize, both in private and in public life, that Christ is king, society will at last receive the great blessings of real liberty, well-ordered discipline, peace, and harmony. And again, that's Pope Pius XI in Quas Primas on Christ the King. And that is the only answer to our problems of the world. It's not socialism it's not communism it's not this dissolute liberty to do anything that you want because you have a so-called right to do whatever you want those are the errors of the modern age those are the errors of the united states of america of the bill of rights of the constitution of the declaration of independence of the declaration of the rights of man both in the french revolution and the united nations charter but you don't hear this from the modern Novus Ordo, quote-unquote, pontiffs. No, they bow down to the altar of the universal republic. They bow down before the altar of ecumenism and of religious indifferentism. You never hear of the reign of Christ the King. You never hear of the call to conversion to the one true faith. You never hear the call to, for, the, for the nations to unite under Christ the King. Why is that? Because those men don't have the faith. They don't believe that outside the church there is no salvation. They don't believe that Christ is king over nations, over mankind. If they did, they would proclaim it. So you can hear the difference in the voices of these true shepherds, these true Catholic popes, versus those of the wolves in sheep's clothing. And people look for answers in the Democratic Party, in the Republican Party, in the Libertarian Party. They'll look for it in socialism or communism or some type of uh, hybrid or chimerical construction of these groups that have no answers. They, are not, they, have, they have no solutions. They're causing more problems. What do we need? What party do we need to belong to? Pope Pius X answers that question. He says, For there is but one party of order capable of restoring peace in the midst of all this turmoil. And that is the party of God. It is this party, therefore, that we must advance. And to it, attract as many as possible if we are really urged by the love of peace. But, venerable brethren, we shall never, however much we exert ourselves, 
succeed in calling men back to the majesty and empire of God except by means of Jesus Christ. No one, the apostle admonishes us, can lay another foundation than that which has been laid, which is Jesus Christ. It is Christ alone whom the Father sanctified and sent into this world. The city cannot be built otherwise than as God has built it. Society cannot be set up unless the church lays the foundations and supervises the work. No. Civilization is not something yet to be found, nor is the new city to be built on hazy notions. It has been in existence, and it still is. It is Christian civilization. It is the Catholic city. It has only to be restored continually against the unremitting attacks of insane dreamers, rebels, and miscreants. And who are these insane dreamers, these rebels, these miscreants of our day? I think all of you know well who they are, the leaders of the world, from this country to Canada, to the European Union, to the United Nations, to the insane lunatic Klaus Schwab of the World Economic Forum. These men who want a society without God because they believe themselves to be God and are leading everyone headlong into ruin. Pope Benedict XV, in July of 1920, in his motu bonum sanum, eerily predicted where we are now. Because these pontiffs could see where this all was going. They're wise and holy men, unlike the Novus Ordo frauds that we have had since 1958, who haven't warned anything about this instead of embraced the, the godless New World Order. The insane dreamer Francis, another one. But let's listen to this ominous warning, this prediction of Benedict the Fifteenth. The advent of a universal republic, which is longed for by all the worst elements of disorder and confidently expected by them, is an idea which is ripe for execution. From this republic, based on the principles of absolute equality of men and community of possessions, would be banished all national distinctions, nor in it would the authority of a father over his children, or of the public power over the citizens, or of God over human society, be any longer acknowledged. If these ideas are put into practice, there will inevitably follow a reign of unheard of terror. End quote. And this is exactly where we are right now. He's talking there about a banishment of all national distinctions. What have we been getting drilled in our mind from the Masonic media, the communist media? That nationalist, white nationalist, that is anathema to these, these Marxist globalists. There he talks about this community of possessions, communism, the Great Reset. You will own nothing and you'll be happy. All this insane nonsense. He talks about the authority. There would no longer be authority of a father over his children. And this is what they're trying to do in the schools. You know, a, a, child, a child can't vote, but he can, he can get his, his body mutilated to become um, a pretend woman or a pretend man or whatever these insane people want to assign to, to these poor children. Um, you know, it's all there in this one short paragraph. And it is going to, it is an unheard of reign of terror for many people right now throughout the world. And it is going to be even worse because they're forcing these false ideas, these dangerous and satanic ideas onto everyone in the world. Otherwise, you will be ostracized, banned, blocked, removed from society. Now let's move on to freedom of speech. So this is a false claim that man has the liberty, the freedom to be able to think, speak, print, act in his opinions, even if they're false. Now, man does have a free will to do that which is evil and which is contrary to his nature, but he doesn't have a right to do it. And as an example, I mean, the First Amendment claims that Protestants, Buddhists, Satanists, atheists, you name it, immoral men, whoever it is, have the quote-unquote right not only to think whatever they wish, 
but also to, to speak it, to print it, to put it on TV, on radio, to practice it publicly. And this is the foundation of Satanism. What is the law of Satanism? Do what thou wilt is the whole of the law. Do whatever you want. Liberty. It's the, it's the same lie of the Garden of Eden. The serpent tempts Eve and Adam. Eve sees the forbidden fruit. It looks pleasing to her eyes. She wants that forbidden knowledge. And she is not going to be held back from it. It's her right to take that fruit. But in doing so, she's calling God a liar and believing Lucifer. So we each have to make a decision. We each have free will. But we don't have a right to do evil. And there are consequences to doing evil. And we saw that with the fall of mankind. And then what happened? They had that knowledge. And then they died the death. And we all have to die the death. And what's curious is, many of you know, the Freemasons wear those, the apron. But what happened when, when Eve and Adam ate from that forbidden fruit? They put aprons on to cover themselves from their nakedness. It's all symbolic. It all has meaning. And following this line of thought, we can say that Freemasonry officially began in the Garden of Eden. Eve, the first free thinker. And look what it led to her and her husband to then have to deal with in their lives and then the destruction of society from this so-called free thought, from this liberty. Again, this type of liberty leads to slavery, to sin, slavery to Satan, and ultimately death, physical death, and eternal death. So now let's listen to what the popes have to say about this so-called right of free speech. I'm going to start here with uh, Pope Gregory XVI. Again, this is from his encyclical letter, Mararivos. He says the following. Here we must include that harmful and never sufficiently denounced freedom to publish any writings whatever and disseminate them to the people, which some dare to demand and promote with so great a clamor. We are horrified to see what monstrous doctrines and prodigious errors are disseminated far and wide in countless books, pamphlets, and other writings, which, though small in weight, are very great in malice. We are in tears at the abuse which proceeds from them over the face of the earth. Some are so carried away that they contentiously assert that the flock of errors arising from them is sufficiently compensated by the publication of some book which defends religion and truth. Every law condemns deliberately doing evil, simply because there is some hope that good may result. Is there any sane man who would say poison ought to be distributed, sold publicly, stored, and even drunk, because some antidote is available, and those who use it may be snatched from death again and again? The Church has always taken action to destroy the plague of bad books. This was true even apostolic times, for we read that the apostles themselves burned a large number of books. It may be enough to consult the laws of the Fifth Council of the Lateran on this matter, and the Constitution which Leo X published afterwards, lest that which has been discovered advantageous for the increase of the faith and the spread of useful arts be converted to the contrary use and work harm for the salvation of the faithful. This also was of great concern to the Fathers of Trent, who applied a remedy against this great evil by publishing that wholesome degree concerning the index of books which contain false doctrine. We must fight valiantly, Clement XIII says, in an encyclical letter about the banning of bad books. As much as the matter itself demands and must exterminate the deadly poison of so many books, for never will the material for error be withdrawn unless the criminal sources of depravity perish in flames. Thus, it is evident that that this Holy See has always striven throughout the ages to condemn and to remove suspect and harmful books. The teaching of those who reject the censure of books as too heavy and onerous a burden causes immense harm to the Catholic people and to this See. They are even so depraved as to affirm that it is contrary to the principles of law, and they deny the Church the right to decree and to maintain it. 
Let's now listen to Pope Leo XIII from his encyclical letter, Immortale Dei. And this was on the Christian constitution of states. He says, So, too, the liberty of thinking and of publishing, whatsoever each one likes, without any hindrance, is not in itself an advantage over which society can wisely rejoice. On the contrary, it is the fountainhead and origin of many evils. Liberty is a power perfecting man, and hence should have truth and goodness for its object. But the character of goodness and truth cannot be changed at option. These remain ever one and the same, and are no less unchangeable than nature itself. If the mind assents to false opinion, and the will chooses and follows after what is wrong, neither can attain its native fullness, but both must fall from their native dignity into an abyss of corruption. Whatever, therefore, is opposed to virtue and truth may not rightly be brought temptingly before the eye of man, much less sanctioned by the favor and protection of the law. A well-spent life is the only way to heaven, whither all are bound, and on this account the state is acting against the laws and dictates of nature whenever it permits the license of opinion and of action to lead minds astray from truth and souls away from the practice of virtue. To exclude the church, founded by God himself, from life, from laws, from the education of youth, from domestic society, is a grave and fatal error. A state from which religion is banished can never be well regulated, and already perhaps more than is desirable is known of the nature and tendency of the so-called civil philosophy of life and morals. The Church of Christ is the true and sole teacher of virtue and guardian of morals. She it is who preserves in their purity the principles from which duties flow and, by setting forth most urgent reasons for virtuous life, bids us not only to turn away from wicked deeds, but even to curb all movements of the mind that are opposed to reason, even though they be not carried out in action. Pope Pius XII said, That which is opposed to the truth of the faith, infallibly revealed by God, is necessarily an error, and the same rights which are objectively recognized for truth cannot be afforded to error. In this manner, liberty of thought and liberty of conscience have their essential limits in the truthfulness of God in Revelation. So what these popes are telling us is that if an idea isn't true, then men have no right to even hold it as an opinion, much less broadcast it or put it in print or act upon it in any way. Error has no rights. And there are many other condemnations of freedom of speech, freedom of the press that the church has condemned you know, from other popes, other saints, doctors of the church. You know, it's, it's well known that ch the church has enforced censorship. And this is to protect the salvation of souls. And we have seen this error of religious liberty, liberty of press, liberty of conscience, just run rampant in this country. I mean, unless you're living in a cave, it's, it's fairly obvious. I mean, one of the one case that stands out would be, you know, Satanists now having Satan clubs in, in schools, putting their ugly statues up, having black masses, because they say it's their quote-unquote right. But again, there is no right to error. There is no right to evil. There is a free will, but you don't have a right to practice that publicly. Now, we've heard from several popes that Catholicism is supposed to be the official religion of all nations, you know, the social the social kingship of Christ. But there is an exception, so to speak, of that, and that's what's called toleration. So that's where if a country or a leader was to make Catholicism the official religion and it would cause greater problems, uh, it can be permissible to tolerate the practice of false religions, but in private. So... You know, what would have happened in the United States if the president forced, you know, enforced the Catholic teaching, uh, both back then and now, it would most likely have been a result because the Protestants were so anti-Catholic. And even today, if, if uh, all of a sudden, 
you know, miraculously Biden were to convert and do this, there'd be a, a huge revolt. And there'd be plenty of these so-called liberal modernist Catholics that would probably join in that because they've been so indoctrinated and brainwashed by the, you know, the, the Masonic society that we live in. So there is room for a certain toleration, but it's not, it's not the same as making all religions equal. So in a truly Catholic country, we wouldn't be talking about an indifferentism that we see now, you know, a Masonic indifferentism, a Masonic form of ecumenism. No, Catholicism would be the one true faith, the one religion, and those who wanted to practice these false religions, that would be their choice, but they would do it privately. No public displays of it, no promotion of it publicly. Be the press, you know, the radio, whatever it might be. But keep in mind that even after the passing of the First Amendment, which was in 1791, these so-called lovers of liberty continued to ban Catholics from holding public office. And that was until 1806. And the uh, not-so-fine state of New Jersey didn't lift that ban until 1844. You know, so, so how do you like that? You know, liberty for me, but not for thee, if you're a Catholic. So today, as you saw in the beginning of this video, that quote I had from Pope Leo XIII, you know, the world has had enough hearing of the rights, the so-called rights of man. Let it hear something of the rights of God. You know, today, humanity is worshiping these so-called rights of man. And in the United States, it's been a worship of that liberty, you know, of these founding fathers as if they're saints, as if the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, those are the sacred scriptures of the United States. And anyone who exposes these errors or talk down to them somehow is, is not being patriotic, is not being a good citizen. But the duty of us Catholics is first to Almighty God and to the Church. And to be truly patriotic is to help our fellow citizens of this country out of their errors, out of the lies of the age. Because eternity is a long time. And we each have a duty before God to give him the worship and honor that is due and to assist our fellow citizens also in leading them to the truth. And it doesn't matter what a Gallup poll might say. It doesn't matter what people, the majority vote is. If the majority of the people vote for a lie, it's still a lie. If the majority of the people vote to make that which is evil good, it doesn't change the objective reality that what is evil will always be evil. And so our call as Catholics, our duty to Christ the King, is to make that truth, his truth of his one holy Catholic Church, shine forth as the true beacon of hope, of true liberty, of true freedom. That is what we are called for. That is what we must strive for. And let us hope that one day soon, we truly will be one nation under the one true God, the creator of heaven and earth, and that that sacred heart of Jesus will be emblazoned upon the flag so that he may truly reign as is his right, as God and King. And here we are, over 240 years later, and what has Lady Liberty given us? She has given us endless wars to force the false gospel of democracy throughout the world. She has given us pornography, the mass murder of tens of millions of infants in the womb, obscenity in music, film, and the press, sodomite rights to promote perversion. She has given us even higher taxes a worthless currency, usury, debt of epic proportions, and leaders who are morally bankrupt. She has allowed generation and generation of our youth to be indoctrinated into these false tenets 
and into the lies of socialism and communism. Two systems of government that have always and will always fail because they are contrary to the natural order of men in society and seek to rob man of what is rightly due to him for his labor and rob him of his relationship with God. We have reached the natural end of where this so-called liberty, these rights of man, takes us. And that end is a world of immorality, decadence, confusion, poverty, and chaos. I'm deeply saddened by all of this, and I'm saddened that I have been deceived all these years into thinking that the doctrines of the Founding Fathers were actually good, when nothing could be further from the truth. Their doctrines seek to take me away from Christ. They don't lead me into a deeper relationship with Him in His Sacred Heart. Instead, their false idol of liberty is designed to enslave us to a sinful life of vice, vice of every variety, and lead us to believe that somehow this makes us free. Their false ideas is nothing more than a repackaging of the same lie the serpent told Eve, that if only she ate from the tree, she would no longer be subject to God, but become a God unto herself. That tree that she took from, that's the tree of liberty, a false liberty, a false liberty that seeks to replace the laws of God, which gives us true freedom. It replaces it with the so-called rights of man, and those rights of man enslave us. We must pray for our country and our countrymen who are lost in this sea of deception. We must pray for our leaders, that Christ may have mercy upon them and open their eyes, as he has with us. Had we been born into the same families they grew up in, can we say that we'd be any different? Are we not even more guilty for not having the same passion for Christ and promoting his one church as the passion they do for promoting the devil and his lies? Is it not a gift from Almighty God that we have been given true enlightenment to see through this massive deception? What should we do with this gift, this grace he has given us? Should we be fearful? Should we despair? Should we keep silent? No. We have a duty to Christ, to his church, and to our fellow countrymen to aid them in this spiritual battle. We have a duty to help the blind man so that he doesn't fall into the pit. We must lead by example, and that example should mirror that of the martyrs of every age. You have heard it said, give me liberty or give me death. But I say to you, give me Christendom or give me death. Give me Christ as my king, and to hell with the prince of this world, who was a liar and a murderer from the beginning. Let us implore Our Lady to pray and intercede for our country, for she is truly the refuge of sinners, and at this hour, our only hope. Let us pray that she may crush the head of Lady Liberty, that she may crush the pride of the impious, and crush the head of the serpent. Let us pray and hope that one day we may see that false idol of the Statue of Liberty taken down and put up in New York Harbor a statue of Our Lady holding the infant Jesus with their arms outstretched and the Christ child saying to us all, Come to me, all you that labor and are burdened, and I will refresh you.
باشه